Hello and welcome to the Cinderella podcast, where we watch and review every Cinderella adaptation we can get our hands on, discussing the same story over and over until we slowly go insane. I'm Liv. And I'm Talon, and today we watched Cinderella's Love Lesson, made in 1953, which is essentially a burlesque number set to music and then just videoed, and it was written and directed and stars Lily St. Sir, I think is how her name is said. What do you think? I think that's Brown Sincere. Like sincere, but with a but said weird. Oh. Sincere. Okay. Yeah, because like Saint Just is pronounced Saint Just. I think it's Sincere. Did you know that there's a version in which people pronounce Saint John as Sinjin? Yes. I hated that when I was reading Jane Eyre. Yeah. And also listening to the audiobook of Jane Eyre. And I was like, who's Sinjin? Where it did is, St. John go? It is pronounced Sinjin, though. That is I the I com- don't like that. That's, that's super legit. I was very thrown the first time I ran across it. So anyway, this is a burlesque number. It's like a very, very mild 50s striptease. And uh, proceed with this episode accordingly. I don't know how to phrase this. This is so unsexy by today's standards. It's very clearly meant to be erotic but it is not because we have bathing suits and we routinely see each other's legs so i wouldn't even rate this pg-13 like this is firmly in pg category in terms of what we actually see but the the intent is sexual yes which, by the way, made for a very weird viewing experience for me. I was much more uncomfortable watching this mm-hmm. than they had been watching Cinder- a nudie cutie. Yeah. With Cinderella's golden bra. Yeah, because in Cinderella's golden bra, we do see boobies, but they're very non-sexualized. And everything in this has extreme sexual content. Like, it's filmed with the intent that we, the audience, are supposed to be very attracted to this. There's a lot of, like, very coy eye contact and looking away and then looking back at the camera and smiling and casting your eyelashes down. And I was just like, oh, stop putting on your shoes weird. Yes. Stop putting on your shoes weird could definitely be the title of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let's get into it. Yeah. All right. So, uh... You get to start this. Great. What happens? So we start out with this very lovely title card that has like a little drawing of Cinderella and the prince together. And we get some credits. And there's music. And how would you describe the music, Liv? It it felt kind of pretentious to me. I have slow, steamy music in my notes. Oh, okay. It's the background music that plays in old nightclub scenes in movies. So you watch a nightclub scene in a movie made in 1940. This is the music that's playing in the background. Okay. Okay, Okay. yes. Let's go with that. And then we open on Cinderella cleaning the floor. And right at this moment, I was like, I don't don't think I should be watching this. Because the first shot we see is Cinderella on her hands and knees. But we see it top down. Mm -hmm. And she kind of looks coquettishly over her shoulder at me. As she's like scrubbing the floor. And I was like, ooh, I don't like this. I, this is a weird choice. Why did they do this? And then they immediately switch to a completely normal shot of her scrubbing the floor on her hands and knees. And I'm like, am I making the sexual? Am I the creep? Am I the pervert? Like, what's nope. going on? Nope. So, so last week we saw Cinderella scrub floors in the way that a normal person scrubs floors. This was somebody in a very serious yoga cat position. Like the cat cow combo, back mm-hmm. seriously curved downwards, not arched up like a cat. And she was sticking her butt out. Yes. So let's just describe her real quick. She is extremely blonde, just mm-hmm. the blondest blonde that has ever blonded. Her hair is up. It's a very 1950s, sort of very tight curls, tight to her head, updo kind of thing. She's wearing a hot pink skirt that's about ankle length with a black vest bodice type thing over sort of a frilly white underdress with a little white 
floppy maid cap. It looks kind of like Princess Aurora's outfit in Sleeping Beauty. Yes. But kind of like floofier. Yes, exactly. That's a good description. And I would describe her kind of like if Marilyn Monroe dressed up as Lucille Ball. Yep. That, yes, I, that is correct. The room that she's in is just the background of it is just completely painted just very obviously painted there is a window that's been painted on with little panes of glass and a crack and a painted flower and a painted windowsill and a painted fireplace and a painted floor it's very two-dimensional it does not attempt to do a 3d illusion no not at all and it's not like very well painted in the sense that like there's depth and perspective it's just a painted background Mm -hmm. and it looks less dimensional than like a stage performance of cinderella somehow this will be important later the door is also just painted on yes Mm -hmm. however there is a real pot in the painted fireplace there is a real sort of stool there is a real spindle why i don't know why there's a spindle but there is she never touches it no but on the stool there is a stuffed kitten yeah it's just a toy it's just a children's fuzzy kitten toy but we're definitely meant to believe that it's a real animal because at one point cinderella picks the toy up and like kisses it on the forehead and places it back down guys i can't it's a beanie baby. It's a beanie baby. I cannot express to you how much this is a beanie baby. Yeah, like it doesn't look even, even remotely. remotely. No. Anyways. <laughs> but I guess Cinderella is tired from all of this work, I guess, because she yawns and then she lies down on this floor and she starts to kick her legs in the air. She's also wearing high heels and has been this whole time. Yeah. Like little little pumps. Little strappy heels, too. They're cute. And she's wearing long sort of Betty boot bloomers that are all frilly and go all the way down to her ankles, which are adorable. her knees. They go past her knees. Okay, like her mid-calf. Okay, fine. Mid-calf. Well, we compromise. (laughs) And so she's on her back and she just puts her legs straight up in the air. We just look at her ankles for a while as she sort of kicks her legs back and forth. A little bit. At this point, I wrote in my notes in all caps, this feels dirty, question mark. Because I was still trying to believe that this was going to be like a Cinderella movie. I did not realize that I was watching a burlesque number. Yep. Until roughly around this point. Yep. So just a fun note for you, Talon. My typing on these is always horrible. Like my spelling is just whatever letters my fingers happen to hit. But this mm-hmm. new computer is auto-correcting things for me, so it corrected however the hell I spelled ankles to asks. <laughs> and I'm like, I wonder how I spelled ankles that it thought I meant asks. <laughs> Anyways. Mystery for another day. <laughs> so Cinderella takes her shoes off very slowly mm-hmm. and then does like some pointy-toed it looks like foot exercises i don't know it looks like she's stretching for like a dance class but in the air while laying on her back yes and then she takes her dress off but she's wearing like a shift underneath it it's a very frilly underdress i mean it's basically a second dress but this one's white and slightly shorter and titillating i guess i I guess and she picks up her broom and starts to dance with her room She has a full face of makeup on, by the way, guys. She has very heavily painted on eyebrows, very, very, very bright, almost orange red lipstick. Her nails are all completely perfect and done. Yep. Yep. But then she gets bored dancing with the broom and she decides to take off her bloomers. So she hikes up her skirts to the mid thigh and then slowly (laughs) rolls down her bloomers one leg at a time. Again, I can't emphasize this enough. We're seeing from the thigh down. This is just the shorts that I wear in the summer. That's how much of her legs you're seeing is just summer attire now. Yes. But she is undressing, so I guess that's provocative. Uh, When she was done dancing with the broom, she also thrust it away from her and kind of like threw it across the room and then looked very surprised at herself. And then was like, I guess I'll take off my pantaloons. Her phase journey is just incredible through this. Yeah. 
If you guys are wondering why we haven't described a stepmother or a stepsister, <laughs> keep waiting. It will never happen. <laughs> and now we get our fairy godmother. Which oh, is, do we live? <laughs> it is a wand that comes out of nowhere. There is not a person attached to it. There's not even a hand attached to it. A wand appears from off screen and taps something. Right now it taps her head and a little crown appears on top of her head. Well, she slowly takes her hat off while looking at a hand mirror. Oh, right. And then right. there's a crown because the magic wand thing happened while I wasn't paying attention. And she just admires herself for a while. Yep. She sort of kind of like walks around the room looking into the little hand mirror. She curtsies to herself and then she glances over at the stool where she had thrown her bloomers and the disembodied wand has turned them into nylon stockings and her really cute little strappy heels have become different cute little heels. But chunkier? Yeah. So like... I guess less sexy if you're going for that. I think those were supposed to be slightly more formal strappy shoes. Oh. I don't. So the I first just... ones look more <laughs> suitable for like a tea party and the second ones look more suitable for like the theater. I understand that they're doing things to be sexy, but because they are not sexy to me, I kind of have to like reverse engineer. <laughs> What's supposed to be happening? <laughs> what's supposed to be happening and so i'm just like analyzing everything and asking is this because it's sexy is this are we doing this for sexy reasons and i'm looking at like a teapot and i'm confused yes that feeling will remain the entire time <laughs> that feeling will never fade so she walks over to the spinning wheel now she still won't interact with it but she's over by it now and she starts to slowly put on these nylon stockings she holds them up so we can see how sheer they are and how shapeless they are because it's the 1950s. And she then slowly crumples them all up into a little ball so that you can put it on the toe of your foot and then slowly puts on her stockings in the very 1950s pin-up pose kind of way. Yeah, perched on the very edge of a seed and then one leg pointed and bent towards the floor and the other one like pointed with the knee bent but in the air. Yes. Like the way no actual person puts on tights. The way no one in the um, history of the universe has ever put on tights or even socks. Yeah. And then there's a lot of like shots of her face looking at the camera and looking away. And the music changes to something more like sultry. Yes. She does a lot of leg extension stuff where she just sort of does almost ballet positions, but horizontally. She just, just bends and unbends her legs in the air while perched on a chair. I don't like that that rhymed. <laughs> but she's doing this with her like toes pointed and we're seeing how tight her tights are. Yeah, and then she leans back and we get the most uncomfortable <laughs> view of her. So she's leaned back over the stool and we see her from above now and she's sort of seductively stroking her throat and looking coyly at the camera and sort of writhing but she's having to hold her head up which makes the muscles on your neck and the veins in your neck and the cords in your neck stand up so she looks very uncomfortable she's doing like this back bend off the chair and she's leaning backwards and her head is tilted backwards so gravity is pulling her head down towards the floor and she keeps having to fight it and occasionally she pulls her head all the way up and then lets it drop again. And I'm just really worried that she's going to pass out because all the blood is going to her head. But I guess this is sexy too. I guess this is sexy. I'm just like, that. you're exerting a lot of effort to hold your own head up and it's, it's ruining whatever sexy vibe you might have had going. <laughs> Please just sit up or lie down. Just pick. Just pick one. <laughs> I understand, like, the idea that, like, somebody arching their back is sexy, but that's not what we're seeing. No. We're just seeing her from her collarbones up. Yeah. So then she stands up. Finally, she makes a decision. And she hikes her skirts high up to her thighs, again, so she can admire her nylons. And the wand comes in again and taps her pinafore. And now she's wearing a 1950s bottom half of a swimsuit. So it covers her belly button. It's like very form-fitting 
very grandma style underwear. Yes, it's very silky, well cut, incredibly high waisted granny panties. I could wear that to a nightclub and it would be, oh, that those are really sexy shorts, Liv. Like that's what she's wearing. Yeah, like this is still within reasonable bounds for a person existing like outside of their own home. Mm -hmm. Like you could walk down the street in it and like it would be fine. Yeah. The wand comes and taps her again. And now the top part of her outfit is the weirdest bra we've ever seen. And we just watched a movie with a golden bra with tassels. It had so many layers of ruffles at the very top that it completely obscured like the shape of the chest. Yes. So it was just kind of like very structured and everything was covered and it looked very like inorganic. Well, not only inorganic, I don't even see how you could wear something over it. If it was the sort of bra that was designed to be worn over a dress where sort of the top part of the bra was visible because it was some sort of weird 1950s thing, then sure. But seriously, imagine you had a bouquet of flowers and you decided to store all of it in the cups of your bra. Yeah. It looked like that. It was erupting. It with indeed. Petals <laughs> yes. of fabric. So Cinderella is very surprised, but she's also like strutting and posing mm-hmm. while looking surprised. And she's striking a lot of very like hand on hip, the other hand at the back of your head, kind of cocking out your hip and very like just modeling poses. Just modeling poses. Yeah. And then the wand strikes again and it turns her little servant outfit into this really pretty gown. Mm-hmm. And I was ready to make fun of it, but I was like, oh, damn, that's actually very beautiful. Yeah. And it's classic 50s. It's very flowy. It doesn't have a big full skirt, but it has a lot of tool. It is uh, a sleeveless bodice and it's got this pink shawl that attaches to the front and goes. The shawl like attaches over the front part of the bodice and makes this beautiful contrast of pale pink to pale blue. The shawl is all see-through and floaty and sort of floats behind her and around her and she gets to just interact with it. And it's just, it's a lovely color of blue. It's very sort of icy blue almost, Mm -hmm. very pale, soft, icy blue. I loved it. And it was this really beautiful pink. Normally I cannot stand the blue pink combo. But the pink was so see-through and also sort of a dusty pink color. And it was such a soft blue. And it was just such a pretty line. Yeah, it was just beautiful. Yeah, it was. And like the drapey thing like swept past her shoulders and then like kind of fell down her back. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful. All the lines were beautiful. Yeah, Mm -hmm. it was just gorgeous. So she picks up the dress and she kind of leans it towards her. And then in the next moment, it's on her and she plays with the drapey thing, as would anyone wearing that dress. Absolutely. Very, very realistic moment. And then she walks over to the pot that's in the painted fireplace. Yes. And reaches into it with a ladle. Yes. And I've forgotten this part and I'm just like, um, what's, what's happening? <laughs> and she stirs the pot and she pulls jewelry out of it. And I'm just going to read you my notes for a second. Oh, please. She stirs the pot and pulls jewelry out of it? Question mark. Is she going to eat it? Oh, she eats it. She's eating it? Question mark. No, she takes it out and puts it on. It's a necklace. (laughs) That is almost exactly what I wrote. That's so (laughs) funny. Except mine has, I, I didn't understand that it was a ladle. I could tell that it was a utensil of some kind. So when she brought it to her mouth, I just wrote, she puts it in her mouth in total (laughs) shock. But yeah, she like slurps it in and kind of holds the jewelry with her mouth, but it's still hanging out of her mouth. Like when someone eats spaghetti badly. Like a dog bringing you a toy. Yes. (laughs) Uh, And then she deposits it from her mouth into her hand and we see it's a (laughs) necklace and she daintily Puts it on around her neck. It's kind of like a chunkier, sparkly necklace. And she's already wearing matching earrings. What a surprise. And then the magic wand appears again. This time, remember that toy cat that we were talking about sitting on a stool? Yeah. And you probably were like, oh, who cares? Yeah. So the magic wand points at the toy cat. And I'm thinking, oh, and then I will turn into a real cat. 
that'll be really cute, actually. It turns into a fur coat. It sure does. And I wrote, no, 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 in all caps. <laughs> and also began to yell at me in person over the Zoom call. <laughs> Yes, because Liv had already seen this and did not warn me, and I went into this blind. In my defense, I had completely forgotten that that happened. How could you forget that that happens? Do you know how many weird Cinderella things we've seen in the last three months since I watched that one? Okay, yes, I do actually know. Yeah, so I forgot That's fair. it. I'm sorry. I remembered parts of it. I did not remember that specific part. So anyway, Cinderella, as you may guess, is not at all disturbed. By the transformation of her pet into an article of clothing, she sees the fur and she puts it on and she admires it. And she, she rubs her face against it very happily. <sighs> yeah. Yep. And she puts it on over her dress. And at this point, I began to once again question whether this was like meant to be sexual because I was like, are fur coats the sexy thing? Is this... I feel like this is going in the opposite direction now. She's put on a lot more articles of clothes. Mm -hmm. It no longer appears to be a striptease. We're very confused. But then the magic strikes once more. It brings a guy into her room. Yep. It's just like a handsome, dark-haired guy in a suit. And at this point, I was like, well, could be the prince. Could be a servant of some kind. He's Who definitely knows? wearing like an outfit that looks kind of like a very oh. fancy uniform. Yeah, formally outfit. He's got dark hair. He smiles at her and he holds out his arm and she takes it and they walk slowly towards the wall that has a door painted on it. <laughs> and I was so curious about how they were going to handle that. And what they did is they got very close to it and then the scene fades to black and it's a new scene. And they're walking. And in... oh boy, they tricked me. I sure believe they left through a door. Oh, absolutely. That was some, that was some magical realism right there. Ooh, movie magic. <laughs> so when the black fades, they are still walking and they walk into a ball that has fabric walls and a stripper pole with more fabric draped around it. It is not a big room, but there's curtains throughout it that are supposed to give us the appearance that there are more things in the room that there actually are. Mm -hmm. There are no other people there. It's just her and the prince. Yes. They're spin dancing. I, I wrote waltzing and then I erased it. They are probably supposed to be waltzing, but they're just moving in circles as a couple. Cinderella kind of pushes away from him and goes in a big circle around the room. And I thought she was running away already, but it turns out it's flirting and she comes back and they continue dancing. Mm -hmm. And she seems like she's having a good time. She's smiling. She's laughing. Silently, there are no lines in this or human sounds at all. It's just... No, it's just music. It's just weird, sultry music. Yeah, the music hasn't changed since they got to the ball. It's still the same music as before. Mm -hmm. So they go to kiss, and it looks like they kiss, but then we get a different shot of that scene from a different angle, and instead of actually kissing, Cinderella kind of turns her face a little bit away so that the prince gets her cheek. And then they just kind of stand there with her kind of smiling at the camera and looking sort of up into the distance as the prince stands there with his mouth pressed to her cheek. Yeah. And it's a very 50s moment. Yeah. If you guys are envisioning sort of a romantic, oh, I kiss your cheek and then press myself to you. No, he's just sort of rubbing his mouth across her cheekbone <laughs> slowly. Not sloppily, but a little bit distracted. Like he got lost. <laughs> and he doesn't know exactly what he's doing anymore, but he knows he's close to where he's supposed to be. So he's just sort of hovering. vacuuming. <laughs> yes. Like when your Roomba gets lost. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. He's just never kissed anyone before. He's doing his best. He's a magical construct. He's only been alive for 30 minutes. Yes. We see a shot of the clock and it's 1155. The clock is also painted onto the wall. Oh yeah. There are no chimes, by the way, in case you're wondering if we get chimes. No, we just get a shot of this 11.55 clock. And suddenly the prince is gone. And Cinderella sort of runs around the room slowly. In the slowest circle I've ever seen. And just moves random curtains to see They're if... They're all sheer. <laughs> yeah, she just sort of floofs some sheer curtains in the hopes that he will appear. And then we get another shot of the 11.55 clock. 
And now her dress is gone and she's back to her fancy underwear. Mm -hmm. And she's holding her hands around her chest, not covering this very fancy flower bra that she's wearing, but just sort of. They're hovering next to her chest on either side, kind of. I don't even know how to describe it. It's like she's trying to get an airplane to land, but near her <laughs> boobs. It looks like she's about to do that dance move that Britney Spears does in Toxic, where she rotates her cupped hands in the general area of her boobs, but then she doesn't move them. She just holds them there. Yeah. And then we get another shot of the clock, and now it's midnight. And now she's wearing a tinier bra. This is now like a bustier bra, and it's just a normal shape and doesn't have tons of bouquets under it. It's just a plain, smaller white bra. Mm -hmm. So that's like underwear, underwear. And then immediately no bra, but she has completely wrapped herself in her arms. So you don't even get any indication that there is cleavage. And then we get another shot that it's midnight now, and now she's wearing modern underwear, or what we would consider as a modern audience to be normal underwear. So just regular panties. Instead of these just plain them. white panties in like a regular bikini cut. Yeah, and she's sitting on the floor and she's clearly not wearing a bra because we can see her side and there's no fabric there. But she's, again, just completely wrapped up in her own arms. So you, there is nothing displayed at all. Mm -hmm. And then we get one more shot of it being midnight and suddenly she's completely back to all of her old servant clothes. The pink skirt, the white floofy dress, the black sort of waistcoat vest thing, the mob cap. She starts walking away and the screen gets dark and then it's the end. And then we're done. Happily ever after. Goodbye. And I was like, what? Yep. Where, where's the next scene? Uh, there is no next scene. That's the end of Cinderella. She we're done. goes to a fake pretend ball with a magic prince that disappears at midnight. And then she gets progressively less dressed and then dressed again. And that's the end of her night. Yep. And at this point, Tala and I went on an adventure oh, to boy. see what the heck had inspired this. And we found out some really fascinating trivia, which yes. we're going to share with you guys now. Yes. I guess if you don't want to learn, you can fast forward through this. You cannot fast forward through this. There are so many amazing things in this trivia that you're about to get. You're going to like this. I promise. So the first thing that we discovered is that the actress Lily Sancier was also the one that directed this and it's listed in imdb as uncredited and then it turns out that she also wrote it and we were like okay well who is she and then we went on a deep dive and it turns out that she's very interesting indeed so Liv, what did you discover first i found out that she is known as the first lady of burlesque she was a famous striptease artist of the 40s and 50s and my favorite piece of trivia is that she got her big break in Hollywood in 1951 when she was charged with indecent exposure during a bubble bath performance. She went to <laughs> trial for, quote, lewd and lascivious performances, and she volunteered to take a bath in the courtroom to prove how tasteful it was. The judge declined this offer, and the jury declared her work to be art. <laughs> she was known as, like, a very fancy, like high class, very tasteful burlesque performer because mm -hmm. she did not flash her pubic hair like others did is what Wikipedia has informed me. She also did a bunch of sort of her thing was sort of reverse strip teases. So she would do a lot of bubble bath stuff where she'd start out nude and then like become more dressed. I feel like mm -hmm. that was a thing that she did. Okay, here's my favorite thing that I read about. So I'm just going to read straight from Wikipedia for you. At the end of the dance, a stagehand pulled a fishing line attached to Sonsier's G-string, which flew into the balcony as the lights went dim. This act was known as the Flying G, and such creative shows became Sonsier's trademark. Apparently, she used a lot of props, and people were really into it. So my next favorite piece of trivia is that she had six husbands, all of whom she divorced, and one of them was Ted Jordan, who wrote a biography of Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe attended several of Saucier's performances and studied how she moved and later incorporated a lot of her moves into her own very iconic Marilyn Monroe style. But Ted Jordan alleges that Marilyn Monroe and Lily Saucier had an affair. Incredible. Yes. Incredible. Yep. 
she is also said to have had an affair with Orson Welles and Victor Mature. Wow. Yep. The last thing I found was that she had a lingerie business, which is called The Undie World of Lily Sancier. <laughs> and it, quote, it designed and offered costuming for, real quote, strippers as well as housewives, end quote. Her marketing for, quote, scanty panties oh, Lord. advertised them as, quote, perfect for streetwear, stage, or photography. And then it goes on to say her later years were, quote, quiet, just her and some cats in the modest Hollywood apartment. I love this woman. Apparently, she's mentioned in a song in the Rocky Horror Picture Show, which I never noticed, but it's the final long of the song, Don't Dream It Be It, that sung by Janet. She goes, God bless Lily Sonsteer. Yeah, that's so cool. Yep. So. Oh, yep. my God. Oh, my God. I just found my new favorite thing. Yes. Okay. So in 1981, actress Cassandra Peterson became famous for her character Elvira, who achieved her trademark cleavage wearing a Lily Sunsteer deep plunge bra. Lily oh. Sunsteer is responsible for Elvira's cleavage. That's amazing. That's amazing. Oh my God. That's the best. That's I have a to go, Nobel Peace Prize. I have to go rewatch Elvira, Queen of the Dark now. <laughs> wow. Aren't you glad you didn't skip this audience? You would have missed this. Oh my god. So she's been in a lot of movies and they're mostly just kind of burlesque or like harem Type. dancer girls. Yeah. Here are some of their names. Love Moods. Bedroom Fantasy. Stripperama. Varieties. Teaserama. <laughs> Son of Sinbad. Books and Beauties. So beauty is a bit spelled with the word tease in it. The Naked and the Dead. I, Mobster. A Runaway Girl. That's amazing. That's a very consistent type of title. And I appreciate that in someone's filmography. <laughs> so I guess we now get to talk about highs and lows for this eight minute reverse burlesque. Yeah. So highs and lows. Okay. <laughs> So my high was when I figured out that it actually was a burlesque number way after we finished watching it. <laughs> because I literally like hadn't put it together. I was thinking of it in terms of a movie. And it was like, this isn't a good movie. I don't understand what they were going for. And then when I read that she was a burlesque artist, I was like, oh, I just watched the video of a burlesque performance. Everything makes sense now. I get it. It's I get it. Yep. Thank God. So basically when the movie ended and I read about it is the high point <laughs> of the movie watching experience for me. My low is definitely when the magic wand came in from off screen to transform what was clearly a beloved pet into an article of clothing. Your dogs agree with me. My dogs do agree with you. How about you, Liv? What are your highs and lows? I think my high was the scene transition where they just walk towards a wall <laughs> that has a door painted in it just the audacity just no no it's absolutely a door i can <laughs> it's i can walk to the store anytime i want to this is a door i thought that was really funny it really spoke of like a very low estimation of the audience yeah <laughs> my low i think is when she takes a piece of jewelry out of a pot and tries to eat it. <laughs> I liked it. That was my second runner up for my favorite moment. It was just really weird and it was uncomfortable because you can't see exactly what's in the pot. You can just see that there's something hanging off of this ladle, but it's in a pot that's all like heavy Grody. iron corrody. And you're like, uh, what is that? I don't know what that is. And then she like, oh, is she going to pick it up with it? No, her mouth. She's just going to put that straight into her mouth. Okay. Okay. It's a necklace. I feel only a tiny bit better. Okay, so for me, I think it's really funny when people do burlesque, but then also incorporate weird and off-putting things. And I've mostly seen it like in drag performances. Mm -hmm. But I really like the idea of her being like, look how sexy I am. And then doing something just bonkers. And like, what are you going to do about it? Like, you're already watching. That's and now she's made you uncomfortable. And like, it's hilarious. I don't know that that was the intent, but it felt like a very playful moment to me that like really spoke of her like personality 
is the way I interpreted it. So this doesn't really fall into the highs and lows category, but I loved that the prince is the first thing to disappear at midnight. <laughs> I, I loved that. Just, you want to have a magical evening with a prince? Sure. Here you go. You didn't specify that he was a real person. Yeah, I just... I fully believe that that was not a real prince. Like, she oh, just danced with a mirage. Yeah. And it's then probably managed. what the broom was transformed into. Oh, <gasps> it was. Oh, that's canon now. That's canon. I wish right. we had seen that. That would have been really funny. That's what I would change about this movie. I'm picking it first. That's what I would change. <gasps> How dare you? <laughs> Fine. Fine. Um, what, would, what would you change about this movie? <laughs> I'd give it an ending. Yeah. It would be nice if it had an ending. What would you want the ending to be? Oh, boy. I don't know. She goes home, and then she cries, and then the prince is there, and they hold hands, and they kiss. End. Okay, that's fine. Or, like, he knocks on her door, and she opens the door, because in my version, the door opens, Liv. Mm. And he's just standing there, and he was a real prince, and he just got poofed into her magical dream. Okay. And he's been searching for her this whole time. I'm down for it. I'm, I'm into it. Okay, great. So I actually really like seeing all the different like things that she was wearing, including the underwear. Yeah. I, I don't know. I thought it was like a really cute detail. And it's clearly like the focal point of the film. And I thought they did it like really well. Like I liked the way that things disappeared, but everything still was like modest. And I liked how everything could have been presumably like layered on top of each other even though it probably wasn't mm -hmm. and i like just seeing like what 1950s lingerie looked like i thought it was very cool yeah it was a pretty cute 1950s burlesque show yeah so do you think our listeners should watch this um i guess i don't know like if you listen to it and you listen to the description and you're like that sounds fun yeah you should watch it it's eight minutes like who cares you can you can watch it. You cannot watch it. It's fine. You're it not missing cute. anything incredible, but yeah. it is cute. I mean, you could watch it for eight minutes or you could listen to us talk about it for an hour. That's both equally good uses of your time. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say give this one a pass. It's weirder than anything else. Like it's it's more weird than it is cute or enjoyable or interesting. So unless you're just super into weird, don't bother. There's there's other cuter 50s stuff. Okay, so when we did our research on Lily Sancier, I didn't see Cinderella's Love Lesson mentioned practically anywhere. It doesn't seem like this is like a really great example of her work. I would maybe, like if you're feeling curious about this, I would look her up and see if you can find something else by her. Mm -hmm. Because she does seem like a very interesting person who has like a really significant history as a performer. I don't know that this was like anything special. In IMDb, this was her first thing. Mm -hmm. So it said that she got her big Hollywood break in 1951, but this is the first thing on her filmography. So I, I don't know. But this was the first thing that was listed. So I, I believe that she went on to do other stuff after this. Yeah. That was maybe higher quality. <laughs> maybe with real backgrounds. Who knows? Who can say? Maybe with real cats. Oh, no, that would have been worse. What one thing would you change to make this worse instead of better? Oh, to make this worse, I would have had her react appropriately to the cat getting changed into a coat. Ooh. Just like burlesque stops, she dissolved into tears and starts screaming and like beating her hands on the floor. Oh, that's so dark. I'm, you asked this question. I didn't ask this question. <laughs> what, what one thing would you change to make this movie worse? I would have her just doing chores at home as the last scene. What have or her, her like waking up from like a nap. I would have her and the prince just walk, but it doesn't fade to black, and they just walk into the fabric, and then they get stuck in the fabric, and then they have to people come and help them get out of the fabric because they're just caught. I said worse, not better. <laughs> okay, so will you ever be watching this again? No, I think I'm good. I think that was enough. <laughs> yeah. I'm good. I've watched this twice. I also think I'm good. I don't, I don't really want to watch this again. Yeah. <laughs> so what's your grade? Man, I don't know. I think I'm going to give this, I think I'm going to give this a C. Okay. Because the ball was interesting. It had, was it? I'm so sorry. The dress was interesting. 
There we go. The dress was interesting. I really liked the dress. It had its own very clear concept of what it wanted to do and what it wanted to be, and it did that very successfully. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it wanted to do that, but it did. Mm -hmm. And it's a really interesting time capsule piece. It missed most of the beats of a Cinderella. It's a no-step family, no ending. It's a pretty weak story, so I can't really give it a lot. There's almost literally no acting. It's just music and posing artfully. But this was enjoyable enough. It was really weird. Watching Talon suffer was super fun. So <laughs> I think I'm giving this one a C. What about you? Okay. Let's go with a D plus. Okay. I can't, like, I can't accept that it doesn't have an ending. <laughs> it, it just feels like they had part of an idea and then it didn't get carried out all the way. So I can forgive everything else. Like the painted on backgrounds, that's kitschy. That's fun. Mm -hmm. The weirdness of the striptease and like the prince appearing and disappearing, whatever. Stylistic, it's cool. I'm interested. But the fact that it just ends with her in the ballroom in her servant clothes and then nothing else happens. Like, what am I supposed to take away from that? Like, how am I supposed to feel? It's not even sexy anymore. Like, even if it had been for me, I'd be, like, too upset about Cinderella, like... She also sort of hangs her head and sort of walks away dejectedly. Yeah, so, like, what am I... That's, it's a, like... It's a weird you ending. You can't end a striptease with, like, a sad thing. Evidently, you can. <laughs> oh, boy. Well, it's almost midnight, so thanks for joining us. If you like this episode, please leave us a rating or a review. We'd love to hear from you, so follow us at Cinderpod on Twitter and Instagram like our Facebook page, or email us at the Cinderella Podcast at gmail.com. If you want bibbity bobbity bonus episodes, or to hear us discuss this week's Cinderella, but with more adult questions, language, and beverages, join us in the Ever After Party at patreon.com slash cinderpod. Our intro music is Bad Ideas by Kevin McLeod, and you can find him at incompetech.com. So Liv, what are we watching next week? Next week, we're watching Tam Cam, the Vietnamese <gasps> Cinderella. Yes! I'm so excited yes! about this. Let me look up the IMDb and just read it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is technically called Tam Cam, the untold story. So I'm just going to read you a snippet of my favorite user review for this. Oh, please do. Tam Cam is like the go-to tales for the old generation when they want to inspire the young one to do more good deeds. And just like any fairy tale in the world, there can be no good without evil. So Tam Cam, the untold story follows the formula almost step by step with the addition of Kung Fu, bad CGI monsters and cringe dialogue. The acting is passable, but sometimes it can get very annoying. The comedic timing made me quit watching, but I managed to finish it later. It got real fun in the final arc with the big battle scene and the hilarious werewolf versus scorpion-like thingy. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Fascinating. So, so this is going to be great. I'm so excited. I can't wait to see what part of the Cinderella story is the werewolf fighting a scorpion monster part. I don't know, but I think so. But I hope it's the ball. <laughs> Me too. I hope that's the ball. I just, fingers crossed. Anyways, so that's what we're watching <laughs> next week. I could not be more excited. You guys should absolutely join us again, because it's going to be amazing. <laughs> well, until then, we hope you have a happily ever after. <laughs>